Welcome to this CUBE Power Panel, where we're going to talk about application modernization, also success templates, and take a look at some new survey data to see how CIOs are thinking about digital transformation as we get deeper into the post-isolation economy. And with me are three familiar VIP guests to CUBE audiences. Tony Baer is the principal at DB Insight. Doug Henshin, VP and principal analyst at Constellation Research, and Sanjeev Mohan, principal at Sanjmo. Guys, good to see you again. Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for guys. Be here. All right, Doug, let's get started with you. You know, this recent survey, which was commissioned by Couchbase, 650 CIOs and CTOs and IT practitioners. So obviously very IT heavy. Uh, they responded to the following question. In response to the pandemic, my organization accelerated our application modernization strategy. And of course, an overwhelming majority, 94%, Agreed, strong, agreed or strongly agreed. So I'm sure Doug, that you're not shocked by that, but in the same survey, <coughs> modernizing existing technologies was second only behind cybersecurity as the top investment priority this year. Doug, bring us into your world and tell us the trends that you're seeing with the clients and customers you work with in their modernization initiatives. Well, the survey is, uh, of course, is spot on. Uh, you know, any Constellation Research analyst, any systems integrator will tell you that we saw more transformation uh, work in the last two years than in the prior six to eight years. A lot of it was forced, you know, a lot of movement to the cloud, a lot of uh, process improvement, a lot of automation work, uh, but transformational is aspirational and not every company can be a leader. Um, you know, at, at Constellation, we. We focus our research on those market leaders and that's only you know, the top 5% of companies that are really innovating, that are really disrupting their markets. Um, and we try to share that with companies that want to be fast followers. That these are the next 20 to 25% of companies that don't want to get left behind, uh, but don't want to hit some of, the, some of the same roadblocks and you know, pioneering uh, pitfalls that uh, the real leaders are encountering when they're harnessing new technologies. So the rest of the companies, you know, the cautious adopters, the laggards, many of them fall by the wayside. That's certainly what we saw during the pandemic. Um, who are these leaders? You know, the old saw examples that people cite, the Amazons, the Teslas, the Airbnbs, the Ubers and Lyfts. Uh, but new examples are emerging every year. Uh, and as a consumer, you, you immediately recognize these transformed experiences. One of my favorite examples from the pandemic is Rocket Mortgage. Um, I, no disclaimer required, I don't own stock and they're not a client. Um, but when I wanted to take advantage of those record low mortgage interest rates, I called my current bank and some you know, stalwart, very established conventional banks. I'm talking to you, Bank of America, Citibank, and they, they were taking days and weeks to get back to me. Rocket Mortgage had the locked in commitment that day a very proactive, consistent communications across web, mobile, email, all, all customer touch points. I closed in a matter of weeks, an entirely digital seamless process. The, you know, this is back in the gloves and masks days and uh, the loan officer came, parked in our driveway, handed, wiped down an iPad, handed us, handed us that iPad. We signed all those documents digitally, completely electronic workflow, the only wet signatures required were those demanded by the state. Uh, so it's easy to spot these transformed experiences. Um, you know, Rocket had most of that in place before the pandemic. And that's why they captured 8% of the national mortgage market by, by 2020. And they're on track to hit 10% uh, here in 2022. Now those are great examples. I mean, I'm not a shareholder either, but I am a customer. I went through the same thing in the pandemic. It was all done in digital. It was a piece of cake. And I happened to have to do another one with a different firm and stuck with that firm for a variety of reasons. And it was night and day. So to your point, it was a forced march to digital. If you were there beforehand, you had real advantage and could accelerate your lead during the <coughs> pandemic. Okay, uh, now Tony Bear, Mr. Bear, I understand you're skeptical about all this buzz around digital transformation. So in that same survey, the data shows that the majority of respondents said that their digital initiatives were largely reactive to outside forces the pandemic, compliance changes, et cetera. But at the same time, they indicated that the results while somewhat mixed were generally positive. So why are you skeptical? The reason being, uh, and by the way, I have nothing against application modernization. The problem, I think the, the problem I have is that it often gets conflated with digital transformation. 
And digital transformation itself has become such a buzzword and so overused that it's really hard, if not impossible, to pin down <clears throat> what digital transformation actually means. And very often what you'll hear from, let's say, a C-level um, you know, you know, person is, well, we want to run like Google, regardless of whether or not that goal is realistic um, you know, you know, for that organization. Um, <clears throat> the thing is that we've been using, uh, you know, businesses have been using uh, digital data since the days of the mainframe, since the, you know, you know sorry, that data has been digital. What really has changed though, um, is just the degree of how we inter of how businesses interact with their customers, their partners, with the whole rest of the ecosystem, and how their business and how in many cases you can take a look at the auto industry that the nature of the business you know is changing. So there is real change of foot. The question is, I think we need to get more specific in our goals. And when you look at it, if we can boil it down to a couple, maybe like you know, boil it down like fairly oversimplistically. It's really all about connectedness. Now, not, I'm not saying connectivity because that's more of a physical thing, but connectedness, being connected to your customer, being connected to your supplier, being connected to the, you know, you know, to the whole landscape, you know, um, that you know, you know, that that you operate in. And of course, today we have many more channels with which we, you know, we, uh, you know, we, you know, we operate, you know, with, you know, with customers. And in fact, also. If you take a look at what's happening in the automotive industry, for instance, so I was just reading an interview with Bill Ford. This is that you know their Ford is now rapidly you know ramping up you know their electric you know their electric vehicle strategy, and what they realize is it's not just a change of technology, you know it's a change in their business. It's a change in terms of the relationship they have with their customer. Their customers have traditionally been automotive dealers who, and the automotive dealers have you know traditionally and in many cases by you know by state law. Now have been the ones who own the relationship with the end customer, but when uh, but when you go to an electric vehicle, um, the product becomes a lot more of a software product, and in turn that means that Ford would have much more direct interaction, you know, with its you know with its end customers. So that's really what it's all about. It's about you know connectedness. It's also about the ability to act. You know, they'll, they'll say agility is about the you know, ability, you know, not just to react, but to anticipate and act. And so, and and of course, with all you know, with all the you know the um, the proliferation, you know, the explosion of data sources, um, you know, and connectivity out there, and the cloud, which allows much more you know, you know um, access to compute, it changes the whole nature of the ball game. The fact is, is that we have to avoid being overwhelmed by this and make our, you know, make our goals more, I guess, tangible, more, more strictly defined. Yeah. Now, so, you know, great, great points there. And, and, and I want to just bring in some survey data again, two thirds of the respondents said their digital strategies were set by IT and only 26% by the C-suite, 8% by the line of business. Now this was largely a survey of CIOs and CTOs, but wow, <laughs> doesn't seem like the right mix. And to Doug's, point about, you know, leaders and, and laggers. My guess is that Rocket Mortgage, that their digital strategy was led by the chief digital officer potentially. But, but at the same time, you would think, Tony, that application modernization is a prerequisite for, for digital transformation. But I want to go to Sanjeev, in this, more in the survey. And respondents said that on average, they want 58% of their IT spend to be in the public cloud three years down the road. Now, again, this is CIOs and CTOs, but, but this is IaaS, PaaS and SaaS. But that's a big number and there was no ambiguity because the question wasn't worded as cloud, it was worded as public cloud. So Sanjeev, what do you make of that? What's your feeling on, on cloud as you know flexible architecture? What does this all mean to you? Dave, 58% of IT spend in the cloud is a huge change from today. Today, most estimates peg cloud IT spend to be somewhere around five to 15%. So what this number tells us is that the cloud journey is still in its early days. So we should buckle up. We ain't seen nothing yet. But let me, let me add some color to this. CIOs and CTOs may be ramping up their cloud deployments, but they still have a lot of problems to solve. I can tell you from my uh, previous experience, when, for example, when I was in Gartner, I used to talk to a lot of customers who were in a rush to move into the cloud. 
So if we were to plot, let's say, a maturity model, typically a maturity model in any discipline in IT would have something like crawl, walk, run. So what, what I was noticing was that these, these organizations were jumping straight to run because in the pandemic, they were under the gun to quickly deploy into the cloud. So now they're kind of coming back down to, you know, to crawl, walk, run. So basically they did what they had to do under the circumstances, but now they are starting to, to resolve some of the very, very important issues. For example, security, data privacy, governance, observability. These are all uh, very big ticket items. Another huge problem that now we are noticing more than we've ever seen are the rising costs. Cloud makes it so easy to onboard new cases, new use cases, but it leads to all kinds of, of uh, unexpected increase in spikes in your operating expenses. So what we are seeing is that organizations are now getting smarter about where the workloads should be deployed. And sometimes it may be in more than one cloud. Multi-cloud is no longer an aspirational thing. So that is a huge trend that we are seeing. And that's why you see there's so much increased planning to spend money in public cloud. We do have some issues that we still need to resolve. For example, multi-cloud sounds great, but we still need some sort of single pane of glass, control plane, so we can have some fungibility and move workloads <laughs> around. And some of this may also not be in public cloud. Some, some workloads may actually be done in a more hybrid environment. Yeah, definitely. I, I call it super cloud. People win sometimes super. at that term, but it's, it's above multi-cloud, it floats uh, you know, on top of it. But so you clearly identified some potholes, so, but I want to talk about the evolution of the application experience because there's some potholes there too. 81% of the respondents in that survey said, quote, our development teams are embracing the cloud and other technologies faster than the rest of the organization can adopt and manage them. And that was an interesting finding to me because you'd think that infrastructure as code and designing in security and containers and Kubernetes would be a great thing for organizations. And it is, I'm sure, in terms of developer productivity, but what do you make of this? Does the modernization path also have some potholes, Sanjeev? Uh, what are those? So uh, first of all, uh, Dave, you mentioned in your previous question, there's no ambiguity, it's at public cloud. This one, I feel it has a, quite a bit of ambiguity because it talks about cloud and other technologies. That sort of opens up the kimono. It's like, that's everything. Also, it says that the rest of the organization uh, is, have, is not able to adopt and manage. Adoption is a business function. Management is an IT function. So I feel this question is, is a bit loaded. Now, we know that app modernization is here to stay. Developing in the cloud removes a lot of traditional barriers of procuring, instantiating infrastructure. In addition, developers today have so many more advanced tools. So they're able to develop the application faster because they have like low code, no code options. They have notebooks to write the machine learning code. They have the entire DevOps CI CD tool chain that makes it easy to version control and push changes. But there are potholes. For example, are developers really interested in fixing data quality problems? All data privacy, data access, data governance, uh, how about monitoring? Uh, I doubt developers want to get encumbered with all of these operationalization management uh, pieces. Developers are very keen to deliver new functionality. So what's, what we are now seeing is that it is left to the data team to figure out all of these operationalization, product, productionalization the things that, that, that the developers have, um, you know, are not truly interested in that. So which actually takes me to this uh, topic that uh, Dave, uh, you've been quite actively covering and uh, we've been talking about, which is the whole data mesh. Uh, 
Yeah, I was going to say, it's going to solve all those data quality problems, Sanjeev. <laughs> you know I'm a sucker for data mesh. but <laughs> Yeah, I know. But but see, but, but see, what's going to happen with data mesh is that developers are now going to have more domain resident power to develop these applications. What happens to all of the data curation, governance, quality that, you know, a central team used to do? So there's a lot of... Uh, open-ended questions that still need to be answered. Yeah, that gets automated, Tony, right? With computational <laughs> governance. So it was oh, not, of course. Yeah. not trivial, it's not trivial, but I'm, I'm still an optimist by the end of the decade, we'll start to get there. Doug, I want to go to you again and talk about the business case. We, we all remember, you know, the, the, the business case for modernization that is, remember the Y2K, there was a big IT spending binge, and this was before the sassification of the enterprise. Right, CIOs, they'd be asked to develop new applications and the business maybe helps pay for it or offset the cost for the initial work and deployment. Then IT got stuck managing the sprawling portfolio for years. And a lot of the apps had limited adoption or only served a few users. So there were big pushes toward rationalizing the portfolio at that time. It, you know, So do I modernize? They had to make a decision, consolidate, do I sunset? And that was all based on value. So what's happening today and how are businesses making the case to modernize? Are they going through a similar rationalization exercise, Doug? Well, the, the Y2K era experience that you talked about was back in the days of, you know, th throw the requirements over the wall. And then we had waterfall development that lasted months, in, in some cases, years. Uh, we see today's most successful companies uh, building cross-functional teams, you know, uh, the C-suite, the line of business, the operations, the data and analytics teams, the IT, everybody has a seat at the table to lead innovation and modernization in initiatives. And they don't start, the most successful companies don't start by talking about technology. They start by envisioning a business outcome, by envisioning a transformed customer experience. You hear the example of, of Amazon writing the press release for the product or service it wants to, to deliver, and then it works backwards to create it. You got to work backwards to determine the tech that will get you there. Uh, what's very clear though, is that you can't transform or modernize by lifting and shifting the legacy mess into the cloud. That doesn't give you the seamless processes. It doesn't give you data-driven personalization. It doesn't give you a connected and consistent customer experience, whether it's online or mobile. Um, you know, bots, chat, phone, everything that we have today, that requires a modern, scalable cloud native uh, approach uh, and agile, deliver, uh, uh, iterative experience where you're collaborating with this cross functional team and course correcting and making sure you're on track to what's needed. Yeah, now, uh, Tony, both Doug uh, and Sanjeev have been you know, talking about what I'm going to call this IT and business schism. We've all done done surveys. One of the things I'd love to see Couchbase do in future surveys is not only serve, survey the IT heavy, but also survey the business heavy and see what they say about who's leading the digital transformation and who's in charge of the customer experience. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Tony? Well, there's no question. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the more things change. I mean, we've been talking about that IT and the business has to get together. We talked about this back during, and Doug, you probably remember this, back during the Y2K ERP days is that you need these cross-functional teams. We've been seeing this. Um, I think what's happening today though, is that, you know, back in the Y2K era, we were basically going into like our bedrock systems and having to totally re-engineer them. And today what we're looking at is that, okay, those bedrock systems, the ones that basically are keeping the lights on. Okay. Those are there. We're not going to mess with that, but on top of that, that's where we're going to innovate. And that gives us a chance to be more, you know, more directed, um, you know, uh, and therefore we can bring these related domains together. I mean, that's why I just kind of, you know, talking where, where Sanjeev brought up the term of data mesh. Um, I've been a bit of a cynic about data mesh, but I do think that where it can work is where we bring a bunch of these connected teams together, teams that have some sort of shared context. In other words, everybody that's, every team that's working, let's say around the customer, for instance, which could be, you know, in marketing, it could be in sales, uh, order processing in in some cases you know in you know in 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 in, in logistics and in, in, in delivery um and so I think 
that's where I think we, you know, there's some hope. And the fact is that with all the advanced, you know, you know, basically low code, no code tools, there are ways to bring some of these other players, you know, into the process who, you know, previously had to, you know, were sort of, a, you know, more at the end of like a, you know, kind of a I sort of like a throw it over the wall type process. So I, so I do believe, but despite all my cynicism, I do believe there's some hope. Oh, thank you. Okay, last question. Uh, and and maybe all of you could answer this. Maybe Sanjeev, you can start it off, and then okay. Doug and Tony can chime in. Uh, the survey in the survey, about half, nearly half of the 650 respondents said they could tangibly show their organizations improved customer experiences that were realized from digital projects in the last 12 months. Now, again, not surprising, but we've been talking about digital experiences, uh, but there's a long way to go, judging from our pandemic customer experiences and we again you know the, some were great some were terrible and so you know and some actually got worse right will that improve when and how will it improve where's 5g and things like that fit in in terms of uh, improving customer outcomes maybe sanjeev you could start us yeah. off here and by the way plug any research that you're working on in this sort of sure. area please do thank you dave um i as a resident optimist on this call I'll I'll get us started, and then I'm sure Doug and Tony will will have uh, interesting counterpoints. So I'm a technology fanboy. I have to admit, I am in awe of all these uh, new companies and how they have been able to rise up and handle extreme scale. In this time that we are speaking on this show, uh, these uh, food delivery companies would have probably handle tens of thousands of orders in, in minutes, you know. So uh, these concurrent orders, delivery, uh, customer support, uh, geospatial location intelligence, uh, all of this is has really become commonplace now. It used to be that, you know, large companies like Apple would be able to handle uh, all of these supply chain issues, disruptions that we've been facing. But now, I, I've, I've, in my opinion, I think we, we are seeing this in, Doug mentioned Rocket Mortgage, so we're seeing it in FinTech, in uh, shopping apps. So we're seeing the same scale and it's more than 5G. It, it includes things like even the, in the public cloud, we have much more efficient, better hardware, which can do like deep learning networks much more efficiently. So it's machine learning, a lot of natural language programming, being able to handle unstructured data. So in my opinion, it's quite phenomenal to see how uh, technology has actually come to rescue and uh, uh, as you know, billions of us have gone online over the last two years. Yeah, so Doug, so to, to Sanjeev's point, we may, he's saying basically you ain't seen nothing yet. What, what are your thoughts here? Yeah. Final well, point? yeah, I mean, there's some incredible technologies coming, including 5G, but you know, it, it's only going to pave the cow path if the underlying app, if the underlying process is clunky. You have to modernize to take advantage of you know serverless scale, scalability autonomous optimization, advanced data science. Uh, you know, these, there's lots of cutting edge capabilities out there uh, today, but you know, uh, lifting and shifting, you, you got to get your hands dirty and actually modernize. Uh, on that data front, I mentioned um, my research this year, I'm doing a lot of uh, in-depth looks at some of the analytical data platforms, you know, these lake houses, uh, we've, we've had some conversations about that. Uh, and um, helping companies to harness their data to have a more personalized and predictive and, and uh, proactive experience. So, you know, we're talking about the, the Snowflakes and Databricks and Googles and Teradatas and Verticas and Yellowbricks. And uh, that's that's the research I'm focusing on this year. Yeah, you know, you, your point about paving the cow path is right on, especially with a lot of the pandemic, a lot of the processes were unknown, but you saw this with RPA, paving the cow path only got you so far. And, and so, you know, great points there. Tony, you, you get the last word, bring us home. Well, put it this way. I think there's a lot of hope in terms of that the new generation of developers that are coming in are a lot more savvy about things like data. Um, and I think also the new generation of, of, of people in the business are realizing that we need to have data as a core competence. So I do have optimism there that the fact is I think there is um, I think there's a, a much greater consciousness 
you know, within both the business side and the technicals in the technology side of the organization of the importance of data and how to approach that. And so I'd like to just end on that note. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and, and I think you're right, putting data at the core is, is critical. Uh, data, data mesh, I think very well describes the problem and, and to Jamak's credit, lays out a solution. This, the technology is not there yet, uh, nor are the standards. At any rate, I want to thank the panelists here. Uh, amazing, you guys are always so much fun to work with uh, and, and love to have you back in the future. And thank you for joining today's broadcast brought to you by Couchbase. By the way, check out Couchbase on the road this summer at their application modernization summits. They're making up, up for two years of shut-in and coming to you. So you got to go to couchbase.com slash roadshow to find a city near you where you can meet face-to-face. -face. In a moment, Ravi Mayaram, the chief technology officer of Couchbase will join me. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in high-tech enterprise coverage.